hey, I want to show you something that's going to help your songs come together a lot quicker. There's a good chance you're doing things in your songs that is a duplication of effort that you just don't have to do. Um, and there could be ways that you are shooting yourself in the foot with the way you're setting things up. So I want to talk about that today. I've got a song here from a buddy of mine. He sent this to me to check out, and this is the entire, he just sent me the entire Studio One song file. So I'm opening it up as he had it last in his system. And I want to focus in on these two main guitars here. These are electric guitars. They sound like this. So just straightforward rock and roll. I'm here for it. Um, but what do you notice, if I zoom in on the plugins here, what do you notice across these two, really these four guitars? By the way, the, the way these guitars are working in the song, these two main guitars play throughout the song. No, they play throughout the first third of the song, and then it switches over to these. I'm not sure why. I'm guessing these might be slightly different tone or different vol. looks like a different volume. Um, but it's really just the same tone across these four guitars. One left, one right, and then done again for the second half. So these are all, as you can see, when you look at this, they all have the exact same EQ. That's the first thing that popped in my head was, wow, that's the exact same EQ curve for all of them, which means uh, the person who mixed this dialed in an EQ sound for the first one and then copied it over to the rest. What's the problem with that? Well, technically nothing. It gets the job done, but what happens when 10 minutes later, you realize, oh, I need to adjust that EQ on those guitars. What do you do? Well, you got to go back and adjust the first one. Then you got to copy those settings over again. And if it's not quite right, you adjust again. Then you copy them. It's a terrible way to work just because it takes so much extra time and you don't have to work that way. So my first suggestion for this would be to find a way to group this together in a way that makes more sense. How do we do that? We're going to select these tracks. The way we do that is click the first one, hold down shift, and click the last one. If they're not all in the same, if they're not all grouped together, you can do that by holding down Command on the Mac or Control on the PC and just click the ones that you want to select. I want to select these four. I'm going to right click somewhere in just the colored section, that not, not on a plugin, but here somewhere on the track. And I'm going to choose Add Bus for Selected Channels. And that creates a bus for these channels. Now, here's something that may throw you off. You created the bus and you don't see it anywhere. Why? You may have seen the system kind of jumped over because the way the settings are right now, it added this bus way over here on the far right-hand side of this session. Why did it do that? Because there's a setting here under this wrench to keep all bus channels to the right. You can decide if you like that or not. I personally don't like, I like my effects channels to the right, but my bus channels, I don't. So I turn that off and we go find that bus. That bus is right here. How do we know this is the right bus? We can click on the little section right here and it shows me what's feeding that bus. I can say, oh, okay, that's that's it. Let's change this to Rhythm GTR. So now we have a name for it. And let's drag it over here so it's sitting next to the guitars that it's affecting. Okay? All right, so now if we zoom in over here, we can see these four guitars, whoops, these four guitars are feeding into this bus and then that bus is going to the main output. Now, with one fell swoop, we can take one of these EQs, put it here, and then we can take the rest of these EQs and say, go away forever. And it's going to sound exactly the same. But now we can use just one EQ to affect all four of those guitars. Now, should you do this across all of your guitars in your song? No. These are four of the exact same tone. It's basically, he recorded it once, panned it left, recorded it again, panned it right. And then... It's on different tracks here, like I said before, but it's it's the same sound. It's the same in my head. The way I'm mixing this is as one thing. It's one stereo sound, so why not put one plug-in on there? Now, you may ask, could we do this with the Room Reverb? Yep. Could we do this with Ampire? No. I wouldn't do it with Ampire because the way the amp responds, it's responding to the input of that one guitar. If we start sending four guitars into that amp, it's going to respond very differently, probably not going to give us the tone that we want. So this is specifically for processing the recorded sound. And in this instance, Empire is a part of the recording, so I leave that where it is. The reverb, you could go either way. You can make a case for adding a reverb like this is a lot like adding a reverb pedal to your pedal board. I'm okay with that. If it was me, I would probably have the reverb added in either here with a, a pedal, a stomp box, which he doesn't have any on here. You could add in reverbs here. Um, or if I added it with a plug-in, I'd probably use the send to do that. But that's, that's neither here nor there. That's not a big deal. That's not the focus of this video. So this is the first thing we've done. We've saved you a ton of time. So now if I want to adjust this EQ, I open one EQ, 
and I can adjust the tone just like that. Another thing I want to look at, let's dive into one of these amps for a second. So he's using Ampire, which is the guitar amp modeler inside of Studio One, which it, it sounds really good. If you've got your own amp model software that you love, great, but you should give Ampire a try. It's got some solid models inside. He's using the VC30 for both of these guitars. And as we switch between, we can see the settings are almost identical. This bass knob is moving. I think that's because I accidentally moved it earlier. Um, but the one thing I want to hone in on is this bass knob, actually. Check out the crankedness of the bass. And let's listen to that tone for a second. I'm going to turn off the EQ. We're going to just listen to these two guitars uh, with the Empire and the reverb, but without any EQ. Here's what that sounds like. got a lot of woo, 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 low end to it, right? Well, that's understandable, mainly because if we just look at the amp, I look at the amp and I can say, oh yeah, there's going to be a lot of bass on that. Unless it's a stupid thin guitar and that's compensating for something else, that's probably going to be a lot of, lot of low end, especially with the treble down and the bass up. So what's the point? Well, check out the way that he EQ'd this. He used an EQ to take all that low end out and then actually to do some boosting up here. My contention is you would get better results overall if you would stop shooting yourself in the foot by creating problems earlier in the chain in your recording phase that you're trying to mix later in the chain with your mixing phase. So here we can very obviously see he boosted the bass only to take it out later. Do those two cancel each other out? Yeah. Was there a purpose to doing that? No, as it turns out, not really. Now, as a guitar player myself, I can tell you, especially if you watch any reviews of guitar pedals or amps, guitar players love it when the guitar sound is really big and thick. We play, jugger, jugger, we make a stank face, and it's got this big, deep, low end. We say, oh man, that pedal, that amp, that guitar sounds amazing because of all this thickness to it. Turns out, though, we don't want thickness in our mixes, almost ever. We want full guitars, sure, but we don't want guitars that are muddy, which is the way these guitars sound right now with that low end cranked. So, obviously, I can see this with hindsight. I can see very clearly that he recorded these with a lot of bass and then EQ'd the bass out. I would say that would tell me to say, hmm, maybe I should record them with less bass so that I don't have to do that much EQ. Now, you could make an argument that maybe the increasing the bass affected the way he performed or the way the amp responded in such a way that wouldn't happen if you pulled the bass down. I could see if you could make an argument for that, but I think bigger picture here, if our goal is to have a great sounding mix, then our goal should be to have tracks that sound as mixed as possible during the recording phase, which means dialing in this tone to not be so muddy on recording day. When I get done with a big tracking day, whether it's just me and some of my own instruments or it's me with my drummer and my bass player, ideally when I hit play at the end of the day with all the tracks with no plugins, I want it to sound pretty stinking good. I don't want there to be any huge issues in the tracks. Why? Because that makes the mixing process so much easier. It also makes it um, less work because as you can see here we boosted here we cut there why not just do neither and solve the problem without having to do extra work so let's just try and see what that sounds like so here is let me just start with the left guitar we'll use the left guitar as an example just so we have one plug in to work with so I'll pan that to the middle and we'll look at this let's dial this tone in a little bit with Empire. <laughs> To my ear, just with a quick tweak, that sounds a lot better. We've got kind of flip-flopped the bass control and gave it some more treble, which was what literally what happened with the EQ later. So if we did that across all the guitars, let's do that by just replacing this here. It's going to pop up every time I do. Let's just do these top two guitars. By just replacing those two amps with that setting, nothing else changes. We can take the EQ off entirely, and we end up with this.
which is a lot closer to the final mixed version that he sent to me, and we haven't had to do any EQ. Now, we may still need to do EQ. Almost always on electric guitar, I'm going to need some EQ in there, right? Because there's even if I dial it in perfectly, there'll probably need to be a little bit of low end that I take out. So I might still come in with a low cut, and I might still pull a little bit of the mid-range down and maybe do a little bit of a boost up here, something like that. But it's a lot more subtle. It's just three moves versus those extra moves there, and it's not nearly as dramatic as the previous EQ was. And that should probably, my guess is, sound pretty good. Now, is this all semantics? Is it all who cares as long as you get to a good sound by the end? Sure. But the reason I wanted to point this out is not only the efficiency of it, but also the idea of if I've got extra low end here, anything else I do to this track before it even gets to that EQ is going to be affected by that extra low end. It's going to have the, the reverb is going to be a lot more boomy because I let that low end be there. Any compression that I might put on there is going to respond very differently because I've got all that low end there. Um, if it's not the tone that I want in the final mix with just the amp itself, let's go ahead and adjust the amp as best we can and then move forward. It'll never be perfect, right? There's no amp setting that needs... Okay, that's not true. But there, it's not uncommon to have an amp setting that sounds as good as it can sound and it still needs some EQ later. That's fine. But when you've got something like that where this was just cranked and it was extra muddy out of the gate, then we had to use EQ just to correct that when it would have been easier to correct it here. Then when you're playing, even when you're recording without the EQ in place, it's going to sound a lot better. You're probably going to perform better. You're probably going to come up with better parts because the tone isn't blocking what you're hearing and you're getting a better tone right out of the gate. You're getting it right at the source. Now, this is an example of using an amp modeler uh, we can adjust that after we record, which is great if you're recording with an amp or some sort of external processor coming into your DAW and you're recording just plain audio files, which is what I do a lot. You're going to need to think through this before you press the record button or you're going to end up with the same problems. So there you go. Hope that was helpful for you, giving you a little more efficiency in your workflow, uh, getting some great results with less movements. That's my goal. I love efficiency. I hope you do too. Thanks for watching. See you.